Welcome everyone, I'm Aaron, and this is Cheap Max Chronicles, episode 01, 1991 Donruss. That's what you see in front of you right now, Donruss Series 2. Um, really quick, I just want to address my video and audio setup. I uh, know it's pretty chintzy, it's the chintziest of the chintzy, as a matter of fact. I'm using a USB headset to record my audio, and my video is coming from an iPad, so, uh, you know, you can go ahead and give me crap for the potato camera. Um, it'll improve, I promise. We'll get there. Um, I'm really excited to actually break this stuff open. Um, Donra Series 2 in 1991 was actually this, the first pack of cards I ever opened up and really got me introduced into the hobby. Really before I even became like a really big baseball fan, I just was getting into cards just because that's what all my friends were doing. And uh, then the cards got me into the sport and you know now it's just a big sinkhole as everybody who's out there in the hobby knows they can really get... Uh, really get uh, pretty uh, hairy in the, the sinkhole there, but uh, that's the way it goes sometimes. Um, but yeah, that's my personal history with the set, and uh, I'm actually really excited to share this with you and get cracking. Uh, really quick, I just wanted to uh, share a couple of things about this particular set. So, this is sort of on the cusp between the, the, uh, the late 80s uh, philosophy of printing sets and the early 90s as they were actually moving into uh, doing more uh, quality control in the hobby and also doing more sort of standardization. Uh, Donruss and Leaf actually used uh, two different sets of printing presses and printing some of their cards. So the factory sets usually got printed 56 card sheets and uh, the uh, uh, retail stuff and the hobby stuff used to get printed 132 card sheets like everybody else did, like Topps did, like Fleer did. And that's why, you know, they always did uh, 792 card sets because it is easily divisible by 132. Uh, but that presented a problem for Donruss when they were always doing, uh, you know, 715 card sets. If you look at 990 Donruss, they were doing triple prints. It just got really, really, really bad. Uh, you know, they were, you know, <laughs> it got really ridiculous for a while. And one of the, one of the uh, kind of things that makes uh, Donruss stand out, this is the first year they went to two series. Uh, the first series was introduced, I believe, in December of 1990. And then the uh, second series went to the press February 91 and was uh, catching some of the more free agent people. Um, you'll see some of those in here. Uh, but yeah, I mean, and uh, one of the things that really sort of stands out is that if you take a look at the way the factory sets and the retail sets uh, were divided up among the printing parts, is they didn't really match up. So you take a look, if you went and got checklist 386, for example, that's your blue series one. And then you can take a look at there, there's your checklist in the back. But what's kind of funny is if you went and cracked open a retail, this is actually a block from a retail set, or a factory set rather. And you can take a look at this card 386, but it's actually green instead of blue. So even though it's technically part of series one, it carries that green series two. It's just one of those oddities that you couldn't really clear up with uh, the printing. But I digress, and yeah. The other cool thing about Nightwind Donruss is they also sort of moved into pure insert territory. Before uh, before uh, Upper Deck came along with like the the uh, the, uh, the baseball heroes, the Hall of Fame heroes, like the the Nolan Ryan and Hank Garen and Reggie Jackson inserts. Basically, you had like bonus cards that all the manufacturers would throw in, and they were printed with the same frequency as everything else. There's millions and millions and millions of copies out there. And really, the only reason they would do that is so you could have like three or four or five different versions of Ricky Henderson or Jose Canseco or something in that set. Um, but with the inserts, they actually went to move to a scarcity. And I believe on the back of this one of these packs here, it'll actually tell you about the, um, the limited editions of the uh, of the uh, um, the elite, and we'll talk about how the uh, the print runs were reduced, and they actually only made ten thousand. And it sounds ridiculous in an age of one to ones that you know they only printed ten thousand of these cards, but you could rip wax all day long and not find one of those cards. It was ridiculous, but that was sort of the the predecessor to the modern insert, and Upper Decks were uh, uh, pioneered it. And then Don sort of ran with it, which is kind of cool. Um, and then as they moved in 92, obviously the Diamond Kings became an insert. And uh, then sort of everybody sort of fell in line. You know, you had Topps Gold. You had uh, 
uh, a Fleer, you know, I think in the late 90s started doing inserts in every pack. It was, it was sort of ridiculous. It, it, again, got to be sort of overkill for the hobby, but that's the way it goes sometimes. All right, enough of me talking. I'm going to get cracking. We're going to take a look at some of these packs here. This is fresh wax. That's kind of cool. So a part of these Donruss's is that you had a puzzle piece in every pack. The 91 cards were the uh, really Star Jump puzzle. The nice thing about the 91 cards is they actually put the puzzle pieces on the back of the cards, uh, the card stack versus on the front, like in previous years, so you don't have to worry about wax staining or anything. Uh, if you, uh, particularly in 87 Donruss, when you're looking for like things like the Barry Bonds rookie, you you know would have one out of every 15 cards that have wax stains on it from the wax. But uh, and then so you got guys like uh, Billy Swift, Tim Raines. I remember Sean Dunstan used to be a big thing, and then you have Scott Aldred. Man alive, that guy! Everybody thought he was gonna be the next big thing. Zane Smith. Bill Doran, Joe Orsalak, Gary Gaetti, that guy was the man. Chris Sable, this is one of those examples I was talking about. Chris Sable and George Brett have MVP cards. And the other thing is that they also have all-star cards and they also have um, base cards. And I believe that Chris Sable also has a World Series card. So in this 91 set, you can actually pick up four different Chris Sable cards. Uh, and they're all you know printed at the same rate. Wally Joyner, Daryl Lilliquist, Danny Tartable, and Chuck Finley. Um, one of the big things about these is that this set really had no notable rookies. Uh, and I was really looking forward to going out and finding a, a box of these. Pre-COVID, you'd go out and find a box for about five bucks and just tear through it. But, you know, obviously with uh, everything being shut down for months and months, the secondary market has pretty much dried up. So. Uh, shout out to Triple B Sports Cards in St. Paul for getting me these packs because uh, I could not find them anywhere without paying exorbitant shipping fees. So there's another piece of the Star Gel puzzle and you'll take a look at the back and it'll tell you exactly who it is and it'll tell you what uh, series of puzzles. They all, all the puzzles came in 63 pieces. So you always got three pieces of the puzzle with your cards. All right. Oh, Junior Ortiz, ward number zero for the Twins. Uh, he was actually the backup catcher of that World Series. Uh, to Brian Harper, but he actually played a pretty big part in the last couple games. Bobby Thigpen, your uh, big uh, saves leader for a while there. Eddie Murray. And this is another thing with uh, the way they printed these cards. You can see all these uh, different spatters of color and the lines and everything. Um, if we come across an all-star, I'll show you, but you have the uh, position line here, which is a blue line. But then you have this little yellow notch as a continuation from a different card. And that is from an all-star card, like Dykstra, Greg Vaughn, Billy Hatcher. See, those are those World Series cards I was talking about. And this one, instead of having some stats on the back, will have a little uh, a blurb about you know what they did in the series, which is kind of cool. Uh, but this, in the previous years, would have been a bonus card, quote-unquote, for Donruss. Um, you have John Smiley, who actually ended up pitching for the Twins in A2. Ryan Sandberg, another MVP. And Ryan Kittle, you can tell. I mean, these you'll see these guys day in and day out. I'm really hoping to see like a, a, a Doug Desenzo or a Rob Deere or something really obscure coming out of these cards. And there's another Thigpen, Benito Santiago. That guy was pretty sweet. And there we go. That's what I was talking about with Danny Jackson. So Danny Jackson was. Uh, he was a good but not great. He was uh, sort of like, uh, like uh, uh, I would say, current guy would probably be like uh, uh, Rich Hill. Uh, you know, he was a sort of a journeyman. He was good but not great. But he had uh, just finished up pitching for uh, the Reds there in a '90 World Series. But over the '90 '91 off season, he did sign with the, the Cubs. So instead of using like an action photo like they would have here. They grabbed his press photo of him signing with the Cubs, so I could have his current team and his uh, current uniform going in the '91 season. Uh, yeah, P Incaviglia, Eddie Murray, Paul O'Neill, um, Dave Steve, and that's another one of those bonus cards I was talking about. So they use these to fill out the print runs. 
Uh, they stretch these, things, these sets as far as they could, typically, as far as players. I mean, if you get into the 600s, 700s, you start really not knowing anybody. Uh, this particular set ran 770 cards. Uh, but in order to make the, the push up to 792, they created 22 bonus cards across the two series. Ron Kittle, Monty Forrest, and this is one of those weird errors that actually the name is spelled wrong, but because there's a million and a half of each version, none of them are really worth anything. Ozzy Guillen, and there's your puzzle. So, yeah, those are the cards. Uh, it's a really interesting set. I mean, the thing is, with these type of things, I have, the, I have a factory set, and I have it right here. And this is my factory set. I pulled card 386 from the Blue Series out. It's not a factory set, it's one I built by hand. But, I mean, there's nothing in particular that's really special about these cards. I probably spent more on supplies for storing the cards than I did, at, you know, than the cards are actually worth. But this is what I was talking about with the All-Stars. So you can see, if I pull out my Mark McGuire here, you can see that, bl that, that blue position line is now yellow, and that's what causes that bleed over into the yellow like that Eddie Murray card. And what's actually kind of funny is that no matter you know where you go, if you go into the the factory set runs, the uh, yellow uh, bleed overs actually appear in different uh, places, and also these lines don't match up. So it, you know it, they they actually created sort of different variations on the design, but because they're just so massively overproduced, there's really no. Uh, no value to, you know, to any of the variations. Uh, that's about it for my first video. Um, hope you guys found it interesting. If you have any suggestions for me, please give me a shout in the comments below. Uh, give me a subscribe uh, and hit that bell. Make sure you're getting the new videos. And otherwise, we'll catch you next time. Thanks.